Welcome again this morning to Hailsham Parish Church and to our YouTube channel. It's really good that you once again you're able to join us this morning for this service. If you're able to do so, do please get hold of the, uh, this week's uh, HPC Family News. That will have some more details about our partial return, beginning uh, in some form meeting together over the next few weeks. But again, just to remind you, to reiterate that for most of us, most weeks, we continue to meet via our YouTube channel uh, at 10.30 and at 12.15 for our Zoom coffee. Now, if you have access to one of our orders of service for today, do please grab hold of that now. Alternatively, you'll see the words for our service appearing on the bottom of our screen. But as we begin, as we meet together in this virtual way, let me uh, begin by praying for us. Our good and gracious God, we thank you as we meet together once again this morning, albeit uh, via our YouTube channel. Please help us to bring our prayers to you, our praises to you. But above all, Help us together to hear your word, your gracious word of life from our Lord Jesus Christ. Open our hearts to hear him and to respond gladly to your word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we begin our service this morning, these words of Psalm 103, reminding us of the character of our God, of his great and awesome mercy. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Open our lips, O Lord, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we say together, we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. At this point, you may like to uh, pause and click on the link to the first hymn that we've suggested for this morning. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. And so as we continue from praise, we turn our thoughts to confession, to that spirit of repentance of acknowledging our need of a a good and gracious Saviour, acknowledging our brokenness, our sin, all that falls so far short of God's standards. And so as broken people, we hear these words of invitation. They come through the prophet Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For as the Apostle John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us 
from all unrighteousness. So hearing those astounding words of invitation, let us pray together as sinners recognizing our need of a Savior. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And here the, the great gospel news. The Apostle Paul tells us, God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And the Apostle Peter declares, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Loving Father, we rejoice that you pardon and forgive all those who truly repent and sincerely believe your holy gospel. Grant us true repentance and your Holy Spirit, so that we may live godly, righteous and holy lives, and that we may come at the last to your eternal glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Once again, you may like to uh, pause our service and uh, click on some of the songs that we've uh, chosen for this morning. Uh, the first song you'll see there, it's a new song from Emu. A song that speaks directly into our need and our brokenness with the assurance of grace and forgiveness in Christ. You see how each verse begins, broken one, take heart, hurting one, take heart, waiting one, take heart. Broken one, take heart, for your king has entered in, made your heart his home when he washed away your sin. A great new song, a reflective song. Do enjoy and reflect on that this morning. And then there's a couple of songs, perhaps more geared to our younger viewers. The first one from Emu, As far as the east is from the west, as high as the sky is from the depths, as long as now till yesterday our sins are cast away, so far away. A great song taken, again, from those words from Psalm 103. And then a more familiar one, Your love will last forever, like a mighty river that flows and flows forever, never stopping. Now, as we come together again, uh, I hope you've enjoyed those songs. Uh, at this point, uh, you may like to continue with the service here, or you may like to turn... To, uh, again to our YouTube channel where you'll find our Sunday School material for this morning and Corrie is leading us this morning and she'll be talking about the King's priority, the priority of Jesus, of making his good news known. But if you're staying here with the service, we're going to join together declaring our faith and we're going to use this morning words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to Titus. We say together, But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying.
when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Now we're going to pray together, and this morning our prayers are going to be led by Chris Taylor. Let us pray. Our loving Lord Jesus, as those whose sins are many, we come before you whose mercy is more, praising you for and trusting in your forgiveness and power to save. Help us to know that you delight to hear and answer our prayers, and so to pray in expectant faith. Amen. Lord Jesus, we bring before you South Africa, where coronavirus cases are soaring, leaving doctors and nurses exhausted and the health system close to collapse, particularly in the Eastern Cape province. We pray for strong political leadership, asking that you enable President Cyril Ramphosa and his government to take the tough decisions needed in the national effort to fight the virus. And we pray for strong medical leadership, especially for Livingstone Hospital in Port Elizabeth, now at crisis point after 18 months without a management team. Please would actions to help by charities, businesses and individuals make an impact. Please grant courage to your followers in South Africa and equip them to share the gospel of hope, life and peace to those who are mourning, unwell and downcast. As we remember South Africa, we remember Adam Tomalin and his work with young people at Hope Church, Johannesburg. Please give him and those he serves alongside protection, wisdom and flexibility. And please help them and the young people they minister to to grow in relationship with and reliance on you. Amen. Father God, with further measures to ease lockdown in England announced on Friday, we pray for a sensible response from the general population and we pray that there wouldn't be a second wave of infection. As the weeks go on, please would our government respond wisely to the changing situation, carefully weighing the demands of public protection, the NHS, mental health protection, and the economy. Please would many in this country seeing how we are not in control, come to recognise their dependence on you. Amen. O oh God of love, in these difficult times when many have lost their jobs and some have suffered terrible hunger and deprivation due to COVID lockdown, fill us and Christians across the world to overflowing with your love, a love that never fails, but always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Keep us from selfishness or greed when resources are scarce. Make us generous, cheerful givers who show love in practical care for those in need as we continue to trust in you, the Lord who will provide. May we show the love of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to begin meeting in person for church services once again and for the hard work that's taking place to enable this to happen from next Sunday here at Hailsham Parish Church. We pray that despite their limitations, these gatherings, 
as well as our continued online services, would be a source of encouragement for those in our church family and beyond. We thank you too for the opportunity to run a virtual holiday club at the end of August, with the potential for more children than usual to participate and for their parents to listen in as well. Please would many families hear about the online event as invitations are sent out and want to join in. Please guide Lynn and others as they plan and prepare, giving them faithfulness, clarity and creativity. Please would Jesus be glorified throughout and many children and their parents hear and respond to the gospel. Amen. Lord Jesus, in a moment of silence, we each bring before you people we know who are physically or mentally ill, sad, lonely, or in other special need of prayer at this time. May all those we've named have power to grasp how broad and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. May they know this love that surpasses all knowledge. Fill them to the measure with all your fullness. Amen. We ask all these prayers in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We continue to pray a special prayer for this Sunday. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the special prayer for this time that we've used throughout this uh, COVID crisis. Heavenly Father, our ever-present help in trouble, our fortress and our God. Calm the anxious fears of all who turn to you. Give strength and healing to those who are sick and courage and skill to those who care for them. Grant wisdom and clarity to those in authority and humble us all to call upon you that we may be saved not only in this life, but also for that which is to come through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we join together, uniting our prayers to pray as the Lord Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, Chris, thank you for leading our prayers this morning. Uh, an opportunity again now to pause, and if you'd like to do so, to click on uh, the next song. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their son. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy 
is more. Do take that song to heart as it reminds us of the extraordinary grace and mercy of our God. Now we're going to listen to the Bible read to us and uh, this morning our Bible reader is Emily Taylor. Thank you, Emily. The reading is taken from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he cancelled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, Her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. We're going to be uh, looking at that passage that Emily has just read for us. So do have in front of you uh, Luke chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 36. And you can find that in our order of service on page 10. And opposite on page 11, you'll find our outline for this morning. So Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. It's part of our our little mini-series, Meeting Jesus. And this morning, it's the uninvited guest. But let me pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, good and gracious God, thank you that your word is life and health for your people. And we pray that you'd give us ears to hear that word this morning. And that as we hear it, so our hearts would be warmed and excited by the good news of your grace and so overflow with love and joy for you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I wonder if uh, you've ever used the expression beyond the pale. 
beyond the pale. Uh, the word pale comes from the Latin palace. It uh, means a stake or a, a fence post. So beyond the pale meant uh, beyond the fence, outside the limits, beyond the boundaries. So a bit of uh, uh, history, when the Normans invaded Ireland in the 11th and 12th century, they created a so-called safe uh, and secure area around the city of Dublin, and they called it the Pale, beyond which, from their perspective, were the wild and lawless Irish, the people you certainly didn't want dropping around unannounced, beyond the Pale. And so gradually that phrase, beyond the pale, came to mean uh, unacceptable, unsuitable, and most definitely unwelcome. Which brings us to Luke chapter 7. And a dinner party at the home of a well-known and respected Pharisee whose name was Simon. Now Simon was a man who ticked every single box when it came to being upright and respectable. And as you read what happened at the party, you'll discover that there were two particular guests. One had been invited and the other hadn't. And yet as we read, you discover that neither of them was really welcome. In fact, both guests in different ways were treated as if they were beyond the pale, at least as far as Simon was concerned. So here's the first guest, the one who was invited but wasn't welcome. Look at verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now what we really don't know here is why Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to dinner in the first place. We just don't know. It, it may be that Jesus as a popular rabbi and teacher coming to town that he'd been asked to preach at the synagogue much as he'd done in Nazareth you can read about that in Luke chapter 4 and maybe it was the custom required that uh, the preacher got a free lunch maybe that was it or maybe Simon was simply curious about Jesus and wanted to find out more or maybe he thought some of Jesus popularity might rub, rub off on him or maybe even it was all about embarrassing Jesus, trying to make Jesus look foolish, to put this upstart rabbi who really didn't know much in his place. But whatever the reason for the invitation, it's clear that it didn't come with a welcome. Have a look at verse 44, and notice how Jesus describes the welcome that he didn't receive. He says to Simon, I came into your house, but you didn't give me any water for my feet. You didn't give me a kiss of welcome. You didn't put oil on my head. Now, those things were the customary signs of welcome and hospitality in the ancient world. That's what any good host would be expected to do for a welcome guest. But you notice that all these common courtesies were denied to Jesus. As one writer puts it, Simon treated Jesus with callous, calculated contempt. Callous, calculated contempt. If he'd wanted to humiliate Jesus, Simon couldn't have done a better job. You see, as far as Simon and the Pharisees were concerned, Jesus was beyond the pale. And it must have made for the most awkward and embarrassing of conversations as they sat down to eat. Now, it's perhaps worth remembering here that uh, in the first century, the homes of the, the rich were usually built around an open courtyard, a central courtyard, which was used for entertaining. And guests would recline on low couches around a big central table with their feet extended away from the table. Of course, in this case, the dirty, unwashed feet of Jesus. Again, if you needed it, evidence of Simon's insult when Jesus had arrived. And of course, often was the case, the doors of the house were kept open when there was a big feast taking place. They were kept open so the 
uninvited could look in and be suitably impressed. Now, only in this case, one of the neighbours decided to join the party. So meet the second guest, the uninvited guest, who's equally unwelcome. Look at verse 37. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she bought an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, in some ways, our English translation misses the shock here. Literally, uh, Luke tells us, it says, look, a woman, and a woman who'd lived a sinful life. Uh, and you get it, don't you? Uh, you can imagine what they were muttering as they sat there. Well, look, look who's walked in. It's her. What's she doing here? Who's invited her? Can't we throw her out? She shouldn't be here. Now that phrase, she'd uh, lived a sinful life, it implies almost certainly that she was a prostitute. And that's given extra force in verse 39 with Simon's comment about Jesus, his revulsion, his outrage, that she'd actually touched him. But the point is that this woman had heard that Jesus was there. She was desperate to meet him, and so she walks in. She gate-crashes the party. It's as if, uh, in some ways, she's oblivious to everyone else in the room, determined to find Jesus, determined to meet with Jesus. And so you read on in verse 38, that with her jar of perfume, she finds Jesus. She stands behind him at his feet, weeping. I wonder what you'd say if you were asked to name the one person you'd never, ever, in a million years, invite into your home. Never in a million years would you invite them round for tea, out for a meal, up for a coffee. I wonder, who would be beyond your pale? Now, she was beyond the pale for Simon and his friends, but who would be beyond your pale? Who would you never invite? Now, of course, our tastes change, don't they? And as we know, history gets written and rewritten. And so do those that we deem to be untouchable, those we deem to be beyond the pale. Someone whose behaviour is so outrageous, so unacceptable, that they could never, ever be welcomed, never, ever forgiven. Of course, in our media, it's always changing, isn't it? Uh, one week, it's bankers and hedge fund managers who are the great untouchables. The next week, it's celebrities. Another week, it's footballers. Another week, it's our politicians. Well, they're almost every week, aren't they? Uh, and of course, it is always the terrorist or someone who's been involved in the abuse of children. And now, it is those from the past with links to slavery. But then again, it may be just someone who supports the wrong team, who lives in the wrong place, with the wrong colour skin, with the wrong sounding accent. Maybe it's just someone who isn't like me. And as far as I'm concerned, they're beyond the pale. Because of who they are and what they've done, they're no longer welcome. Not by us, not by Simon, and not, according to Simon, by God, and any self-respecting person who speaks for God. But back to the dinner party. If this woman is already unwelcome, she's about to make things a whole lot worse. A and embarrassing isn't the word for it. Look at verse 38 again. She comes, she stands behind Jesus, she's weeping, and her floods of tears fall on Jesus' feet. So his feet are getting wet with her tears. So what does she do? She loosens her hair. No, you can't do that, they say. Not unless he's your husband, and only then in private. This is outrageous. But she's broken the rules again. And now, of all things, she uses her hair to clean his feet. The very thing that Simon had failed to do. To clean the feet of Jesus. And she kisses his feet and she breaks, breaks open this expensive jar of perfume that she's just brought and pours it over his feet. It couldn't get more embarrassing, could it? Make no mistake, 
This woman loved Jesus. Despite her, her sad and troubled past, this woman is brimming with spiritual life. Her tears of guilt and sorrow are becoming tears of repentance and of joy. Her hair loosened to wipe the feet of Jesus marks her as his servant. Simon won't serve Jesus, but she will. And his glory is her aim. Her kisses are, are, are an act of pure adoration, adoration of a sinner for her saviour. And isn't that just how Mary sang? Mary, the mother of Jesus, when uh, the birth of Jesus, the coming of Jesus was announced, my, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my saviour. This woman loved Jesus. And what's equally clear is that Jesus accepts her and welcomes her. There was none of the, the self-righteous finger-pointing of the Pharisees, none of the customary moralism that condemns our outward sin but ignores the inward sin of our hearts. No, she, Jesus received her. He loved her. He forgave her. He forgave this repentant sinner as she looked to him to be her saviour. Wow, it's extraordinary. Now up to this point, nobody else has spoken. Not a word. The, the whole room has simply watched in stunned silence. But I want you to notice that's all about to change. So from the guests, let's look at the conversation. Look at verse 39. Simon, of course, is having none of it. He's furious. He's outraged. Such scandalous behavior from this woman and in his house. And the scandal rubs off on Jesus. Look what he's muttering to himself. If this man were a prophet, in other words, if Jesus really was a prophet from God, well, he'd know who's touching him. He'd know what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. And maybe you think, well, Simon's got a point, hasn't he? Surely it's inconceivable that God would welcome people like her. After all, God's holy, isn't he? And God's pure, isn't he? And so so-called moral, respectable Simon would turn her away. And as he turned her away, he'd think that's what God would be doing. Simon the moralist, with a heart that knows nothing of God's grace. Now, do notice here the difference between Simon and Jesus, because so often this is where people get confused. They confused Christianity, they confuse the gospel with Simon. They think Christianity is all about God's challenge to us to be good, to impress on the outside. And when we fail, to expect the finger to be pointed, the divine policeman to be knocking on our doorstep, the book to be thrown at us, the law to condemn us. Well, think again. That's the religion of Simon. That isn't the message of Jesus. That isn't the heart of God. You see, Simon's be good religion has no answer to the problem that lies at the heart of all this. That's the problem of our hearts. Because all Simon's religion can do is, is either condemn us or pity us in our failure. It, it can't face up to the problem. And it can't offer a solution. And so Jesus tells a parable. Have a look at what he says. Verse 41. He says, there are two men who were in debt. One of them owed 500 denarii. The other owed 50. Now, a, a denarius was about uh, one day's wage for an ordinary working person. So, so these debts were pretty large. Now, Simon's religion said, in effect, one was a, a 50 denarii sinner and the other one was a 500 debt sinner. In other words, Simon thought he was so much better than she was. The woman, well, she was obviously a 500 debt sinner beyond the pale, whereas he, he might not have been perfect, but he, he was pretty impressive. And such a small debt, only a 50. But of course, the point that Jesus was making, in case Simon hadn't noticed, 
is that they were both sinners. The woman may have had uh, more sin on the outside, but they were both equally guilty on the inside. The rich moralist and the poor prostitute, they were both in the same boat. They were both up the creek without a paddle, both utterly lost without a saviour. It doesn't matter that one was a 500 and the other was a 50. Both were utterly lost. Her name was uh, Selina, Countess of Huntingdon. And she was one of the great Christian heroes in the 18th century. She was a hugely influential Christian lady uh, and a great evangelist among the rich and the famous. And one day, uh, Selina, the Countess of Huntingdon, she invited the great preacher, George Whitfield, to come and preach among some of her aristocratic friends. And after Whitfield had finished preaching on the grace of God, this is what one duchess said, and I quote, It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches on earth. This is highly offensive and insulting, and I cannot but wonder that your ladyship should rely on any sentiments so much at variance with high rank and good breeding. Well, there you have it. It's humorous. It's funny if it wasn't so serious, isn't it? There you have Simon's religion. You have English religion, the default religion of us all. We think we're okay. Grace, of course, God's forgiveness, the need of the cross, all that. Well, that's for big-time sinners. Not for good people like me. I may not be perfect, but, but I don't need it. I'm fine. Thank you. But, of course, the point is we do. Not only are we all in debt, we are all bankrupt and unable to pay. Regardless of whether we're 50 sinners or 500 sinners, we cannot erase our debt. Only the one to whom we are in debt can erase that debt. Only the one that we've offended can issue the pardon. Only the one we've walked away from can in fact welcome us home. Only God can do that. See, Simon was blind to his need of rescue. Yet the woman burdened by her sin, was only too well aware. She needed God's mercy. And incredibly, that's what she receives. Out and out sinner that she was, Jesus cancels her debt, and it's a huge debt. Grace reaches out to her with God's forgiveness, with pardon. Her debt is erased. Her sin is paid for. The judgment she deserved is cancelled. And now she is free. And what was the evidence of God's grace? How do we know this woman really was forgiven? Well, look at what Jesus says. Look at verse 42. He puts the question, in the the parable, their debts cancelled, which one will love more? And verse 43, Simon rather reluctantly is forced to conclude, well, the one who had the biggest debt cancelled. Exactly, says Jesus. And he reminds Simon just what the woman had done, in contrast, of course, to what Simon hadn't done. What she'd done with her, her tears and her hair and her kisses and the perfume she pours over Jesus' feet. She's seen the depth of her sin. And she's seen the wonder and love and mercy of Jesus. And she pours out her love for him. Verse 47, Jesus says, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. Now, please don't make the mistake of, well, please don't make Simon's mistake and think that her love somehow paid off her debt or won her God's forgiveness. It didn't. Uh, Maybe the Jerusalem Bible has the translation right here. It certainly brings out the meaning. I quote, For this reason I tell you that her sins, her many sins, must have been forgiven, or she would not have shown such great love. Exactly. Her outpouring of love for Jesus was a direct result of Jesus' forgiveness of her. 
Such love. The telltale sign of real life. The telltale sign of a life transformed by the limitless grace and mercy of Jesus. And as if to rub it in, Jesus says it again. Your sins are forgiven, verse 48. Isn't that good news? There are no untouchables with Jesus. No one is beyond the pale. No matter the darkness, no matter the size of the debt, no matter what we've done and the guilt we may feel, none are beyond the grace and mercy of Jesus. None, that is, who would come as this woman from beyond the pale to shed her tears at the feet of Jesus. Do you realize what she's grasped? She's grasped both the depth of her sin her guilt, her shame, and the wonder of the mercy of Jesus. And that's it, literally. Two things above all that you and I need to grasp for ourselves. The depth of our sin. We are far, far more sinful than we ever imagined. And the wonder of his mercy, which is far, far greater. What have we just sung? Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. I wonder if you've ever thought of why it is that so many of us show so little evidence that we really do love Jesus. I wonder if it's perhaps because we've failed to grasp, as Simon clearly failed to grasp here, what great sinners we are and what a great saviour Jesus is. So how do we conclude here? Well, let me say, if you're a Christian, someone who does indeed know and love Jesus, please be careful as you go on in your Christian life. Please make sure that you don't ever become like Simon. Pointing the finger, condemning the rule breaker, excluding those who are, as far as you're concerned, beyond God's pale. Don't be like a Simon. Rather be someone like Jesus, full of grace and generosity, welcome and forgiveness. Never forget what you once were without Christ. Never forget that this side of glory, you will always be a debtor to mercy alone. Always a forgiven sinner. Don't forget those times, again, when it seems that you've taken three steps back in the Christian life. And you're struggling with guilt and your conscience is raw and you know that you've failed. Don't forget, there's nowhere to go, no place to hide, but Jesus. Jesus who alone can say to you, forgiven. We never ever in the Christian life go beyond needing the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus. We will always need to taste that mercy until one day we see him face to face. But then perhaps you're not yet a Christian. And as you read this true story, uh, you know only too well your need, uh, your darkness, your guilt. Well, please, as you read it, forget Simon's religion. Forget uh, resolutions to do this and that, if you're thinking those might be the answer. And come, as this untouchable woman does. Come with your tears and taste the mercy of Jesus. I think it's quite uh, uh, strange, isn't it, that some of the greatest Christians in the past, and you wonder, what was their their secret to loving and serving Jesus, uh, the joy that they knew in Jesus? What was their secret? Can I suggest it was this? They knew they were great sinners, and they knew that Jesus Christ was a great saviour. Why do I say that? Well, here's the Apostle Paul. How did the Apostle Paul describe himself? What did he say? The worst of sinners. Really? Really, Paul? You're the worst of sinners? That's what Paul says. The worst of sinners. Or or John Bunyan. John Bunyan, who wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress. But he called his autobiography Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Isn't that interesting? Great Christians in the past thought of themselves as the worst of sinners. Or John Newton, of course, the ex-slave trader nearing the end of his life, the author of the, the song Amazing Grace. This is what he says, Although my memory is fading, 
I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great saviour. Well, there you have it. The secret to the Christian life. The foundation of knowing and loving Jesus more and more. Living as people of grace. Tasting the joy of the gospel. Two things we need to know. And never ever forget that I am a great sinner. And Jesus is my great and mighty saviour. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Well, good news. Hallelujah. What a saviour. I'm a great sinner. And he is a great and mighty saviour. Let's pray. Our Father God, thank you for this story in the life of Jesus of extraordinary grace poured out. Not to those who thought themselves worthy and had no need of such grace, but to the broken, to the outcast, to those beyond the pale, to this woman in her broken, sad life, full of outward sin, a broken-hearted lady, and she comes and she finds the forgiveness of our Lord Jesus. And we thank you that for all who come, for all who come in repentance, all who come seeking a saviour, there is that same word, your sin is forgiven. Because your mercy, gracious Lord, is far, far more. And we thank you and praise you. Help us to live in the knowledge, in the, the daily certainty of those two things. That we are great sinners, but Jesus is a great Savior. Thank you, Father. Amen. And so, uh, an opportunity to click again on a final song for this morning. Uh, the, the old hymn, Love Divine, or Love's Excelling, Joy of Heaven to Earth Come Down. Now our final prayer for this morning. Uh, once again, uh, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And if you're able, do join us via Zoom at 12.15 for coffee. But our final prayer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.